We grew up with stories. They've been important to us since we were children. And most of the important stories that we grew up with, they had the first few words that we began with, once upon a time. It was everything from the fairy tales that we told ourselves, or were, or were read to us at bedtime, or were read to us in the library, or whatever, to the stories that our parents may have said when we asked that great, great question, how did we get here? And they may have said to us, once upon a time, there were two people who loved each other. We have a couple different ways that as believers, we start stories. As believers, a lot of our stories go back to, in the beginning, was the word. In the beginning, God loved. In the beginning. And we also have that once upon a time. And so what happened was that I, as I played with this, this metaphor of story, I went to some things that novelists, practitioners of stories, said about stories. And so, let me just share a couple quotes. After nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the things we need most in the world. Every story starts with a great story. Every love story starts that way. And then you remember the fairy tale, mirror, mirror on the wall. It's like everybody tells a story about themselves inside their own heads, always, all the time. That story makes you what you are. We build ourselves out of that story. And so I grew up one of five kids, and my mom and dad owned a grocery store. We lived above the grocery store. And while this may give, my, give age away, it was back in the era, at least in Cleveland, that commercial stores closed on Wednesday afternoon. Not just banks, but all commercial stores closed, on, closed at noon. And so, as I remember the story, my Uncle John would come over on Wednesday afternoon, and about one o'clock, he would come into the store, and I would ask him to pick me up, and he would put me on his shoulders, and we would walk around the store, and I would pull the, the lights strings, and I would go around the, the store, up the three aisles, turn off all the lights, and then we would close the store and we would go on a family picnic. I closed the store. <laughs> I determined that we went on a family picnic. I did it. Now, that was my version of the story. And my Uncle John encouraged it in me. He would remind me of how he picked me up and we closed the store together. Now, that's a story that held me in good stead. Because as a matter of fact, I grew up thinking I could do most things. You just pull the string. I, I, I kind of learned something. There was a way that you could do most things. Now there were other things that I, that wasn't the only story. Another story that I knew from childhood is that for whatever reason, I didn't learn to speak early or I didn't learn to pronounce words well. And so I was still going to speech therapist in the third grade, and I was still back in speech therapy in high school. And so I still remember in third grade, Norbert Donovan. I mean, you remember the name, third grade. He came up to me one day and he said, well, what country are you from? Because you talk funny. And so I remember that, and that also shaped who I was in the ease with which I would speak. And so we had a couple different formative stories. And I could throw in another story from childhood, that I grew up not being the least bit afraid of tornadoes. Well, we had a fair number of tornadoes in the Cleveland on, on, on the lake. But my experience of tornadoes, remember my dad had a store. My experience of tornadoes is that when there was a tornado and there was a power outage, my dad would tell me and my sister, that, that particular age group, the other, Sandy was too young and the other two were too old. He would tell Kathy and myself, call your friends and see if they want to come over for ice cream. Because the cool, the freezer, the ice cream novelties, the fudgicles, the popsicles, those would melt really fast. And in a power, power outage, a tornado meant 
I would call my friends. <laughs> I still remember standing next to food. You have to stop as fast as you could. If you can get three down, <laughs> if you can get three down before somebody stopped you, you were doing pretty good. And so tornadoes were not a scary thing. Even though the evidence was there, and I could see the tree on the next tree having fallen into Karen Anderson's bedroom. I could see that. My friend's bedroom had a tree through it. And that story was powerful enough that tornadoes were not scary. So we're talking about the power of a story to shape our lives. The power of a story. And the stories run to our heads. And we have to at some point say, is that story still working for you? Don't you think you ought to go to a tornado shelter? Is that story still working for you? I will tell you something about stories. They're not just entertainment. Don't be fooled. They are all you have, we see. All we have to fight off illness and death. Stories are big. What gets us through the hard times of our lives, if not the stories of hope that we tell ourselves? The tragic opposite is also true. Someone takes their own life when they are unable to access the story of hope. So stories are important. A story of hope that they can believe in, stronger than other stories running through their heads. It's key. So stories <coughs> are told in order to live. In the end, then, we can say there's no greater power on this earth than story. So one of my personal favorite slides is this one. Because it talks about the power of story that is right now, today. At any given moment, you have the power to say, this is not how the story is going to end. <clears throat> At some point, I could say, not knowing how to speak, not knowing how to pronounce words, is not how the story is going to end. At some point, somebody who is incredibly depressed finds somebody who can help them believe this is not the only way the story can be written. This is not how the story is going to end. You are in that privileged place in ministries, in the ministries of the CSJs of Boston. Whether you are on a board, whether you are employed there, whether you direct them, you are, you are in the privileged place of saying, this is not how the story is going to end. I don't care if the story's been fantastic up until now. You still have the responsibility to shape it going forward. If the same story is told of your ministry 20 years from now, you missed the moment. You've missed it. It's, it. It needs to be finessed. It needs to have the next version. It needs to have the next iteration, the next chapter. This is not how the story is going to end. And so how do, you, how do you know what kind of story to craft going forward? Because it's irresponsible to simply allow it to run its course. You don't have the right to do that. You have to take responsibility to shape the story. And so, avoiding the path of least resistance, just letting it run its course, what's this, what story do you want to tell? And what story needs to be told? This is where you need some criteria. What's the criteria for a story today? Well, I think we go to two places. The Gospels is one source. And if we look at the Gospels, is the story life-giving? Is the story of your ministry, is it life-giving? Is it liberating? Is it loving? If it's not, we need to finesse it. If you just think it is, but if you ask people who are recipients, and they would describe it differently, there's, there's a clash. You have a story running in, running in your head that is not what people on, people on the ground are experiencing. And so you need to check it out. If if the this, this story needs, needs to be consistent, this story needs to resonate, if we look at some of the stories in, in Scripture, a story of the Samaritan woman, 
Jesus broke every conceivable taboo when he sat at the well and talked to that woman. It may be that your ministries break some established taboos. You do some things that other people say, it's not going to work. This is not successful. This is not what people want. And you might say, this is what people need. This is, you're going to tell this story. If you go to the Syrophoenician woman, Canaanite woman, it's this great story in scripture where Jesus is walking along and the disciples are kind of pushing this woman out of the way. And she insists and she wants her child healed. And he says, I, I, wasn't, I was sent to the lost children of Israel. I wasn't sent to the foreigners. And she comes back with this. She has this great comeback. Wait a minute, even dogs get scratched from the master's table. And in the story, it's as if, I mean no disrespect here, it's as if in the story, Jesus says, Jesus, what are you saying to this woman? Get a grip. She belongs. Something changed. Somebody asked him a question that made him rethink his very identity. Up until that moment, he thought he was just for the Jews. That foreigner reminded him that he was sent for everybody. If she hadn't come along, when would he have woken up? We don't know that. We don't have that story. We have the story of his waking up, to the, and it was a woman who woke up, who awakened him to a larger call. At some point, people had to ask the gutsy question and be prepared for pushback. If we're not prepared for pushback, then we maybe gave it up too soon. So th that's another good story. The, the prodigal son, that forgiveness to the max is what this is about. The son took his father's inheritance. In the Jewish culture, that was absolutely unheard of. It's unheard of today. You don't take the family inheritance before your parents die. They might need it. You don't claim their pension until they don't need it anymore. This kid, this punk of a kid took it and lost it. And his parents walked him back. I mean, so the, the stories of scripture are liberating. They're, they're, they're liberating, they're life-giving, they're loving. What's the story? These are criteria for the stories that your ministries tell. Who do you feed? How do you feed them? What do you feed them? So, so when we look at what's evident in these stories that capture the power of a story at work, they're real, they're credible, they're, they're palpable. The mystery of God in 40 unfolding in human history, active, emerging. The stories should have that kind of power. They should happen in real time with real people in real situations. Good stories are not theoretical. There are very few good stories in a science book. Unless microchondria really set you off. <laughs> now, at the same time, there are some other stories that are pretty exciting. I'm looking at Pat. There are probably some science stories that are pretty exciting. My apologies here. But really, what are the stories? What's under the stories? And we'll get to that. So, one of, one of, one of my sisters um, worked in El Salvador for a while, and she was teaching alphabetacion classes. So she was basically teaching literacy. She was teaching subjects and objects in language. And she describes the day that she was teaching subject versus object, and the woman she still remembers who realized that she was an actor, she was the subject, and she wasn't the object. And she said, the woman went around and pointed to herself and then said, not furniture, not table, not chair, actor, person. That was palpable. The transformation that was happening because the mission was alive. And it happened in teaching subjects and objects and verbs. So it, the story, the profound power of the story comes through all kinds of ways. So what's the deep story we're telling today? It's more than history. I can tell you about the first women in Lequeen. I can tell you about Jean Fanfan, and hopefully you know those stories. But this is more than history. This is how are you doing Jean Fanfan today? 
This is how is the story so alive in your heart that it's, it's happening. It's right here. You can touch and taste it as palpable as it was for the woman who said she was not furniture. She was the actor. And so it's more than history. It's more than facts. We ask ourselves, what's the story under the story we tell? The story under the table, hidden sometimes, that we have to go deeper and deeper. You know, those, those Russian dolls, that there's something inside that if you don't risk taking the top off, you won't discover it. And you think, oh, I got it, I got it. Oh, no, 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 there's another one. And there might be still another one. So how much time do you spend going deeper and deeper? It's important that we be intentional, conscious of the hidden grace, the story that's under the story, if we're going to keep the essence, if we're going to keep the fire alive. So you have to ask yourself the question. You have to be in conversation. The um, quote that, that, that you shared at Grace, of, um, Meg Wheatley, is the power of conversation. That talking to each other, hopefully you had some of that at the table, that you realized, oh, I wish I got to know this person better. I just met her tonight. I just met him tonight. There's, there's something under the under that's alive here. And so it's not just that we successfully feed somebody or teach something or graduate somebody, but it's the why. It's the for what. It's that great adolescent question that your, your kids may have asked you. So what? If you had the answer to the so what, you got it. Because it's whatever you were trying to get across was worth it. There's a massive so what in our lives. And it takes us back to the Gospels and it takes us back to the mission. And so we go back to then, the themes of the deep CSJ story. The first one you know, you've heard this, loving the dear neighbor without distinction. What does it mean today? We can talk about what it meant in 1650. We can talk about what it meant after the French Revolution. But what does it mean in Boston? What does without distinction mean? In the climate of our society today, I want to suggest that without distinction does not mean that you don't pay attention to the differences. I think this is counterintuitive. I think it means you pay all the more attention to the distinctions, to the differences, and you respect them. It's not like we group all Mexicans as thugs and rap rapists who are coming across the border. And it's not like we're trying to say, oh, don't do any of that. They're just all fine people. No, look for the differences. You can't come together. You can't bring diversity together if we don't know the differences. If we amal amalgamate everybody as the same, we don't need everybody. I have two friends who used to facilitate with each other for 20, 25 years. And they're very different. And they would say to people, well, if, if we were the same, you wouldn't need both of us. You need us both. Because we're very different. We need all the ministries we got. Because we're very different. We need all of you. Because we're very different. And we need all those others because they're very different. And so what you want to do is figure out what are the differences and highlight them. So it's, we treat people with respect without distinction, but we pay attention to all the distinctions. That's, that's one of the pieces of this theme today, because what we're trying to do is accept the diversity, create a communion, create a sense of belongingship and ownership. And we can only do that if people can belong as themselves. If I have to pretend I'm somebody other than who I am to fit, then you haven't honored my, my, my distinctions. I gotta fit as I am, and you have to see me. Another one, a CSJ mission, a ministry, is marked by the quality of the more. This is not quantitatively more. Let's get more busy, let's get more frantic, Let's get more exhausted. That is not what the more is supposed to be about, even though some days it feels like that. That's not what it's about. It's about qualitative difference. It's about wider horizons. It's about being having a clearer sense of the vision. It's about having a greater intense, 
intentionality. It's about having a fuller perspective. It's not about doing more. It's about holding more. It's about having it's it's about having my mind exploded and my heart enlarged because I'm holding a greater reality, even if I'm not moving one step faster. But there's a um, a friend of mine was talking to her older sisters, and she was talking about mission and ministry. And one of them, one of the elders, said, "You know, at my age." I can't do any of those great or, or great or big things anymore. I just can't do them. And her response was, in matters of love, there are no great or large. There's only love. If you think about your family, your friends, there's only love. Is this a little act of love or big act of love? That, that quantitative thing makes no sense. Does God love me a little bit? God loves. So how do we do love in a qualitative way? That's what the more is about. It's qualitative, holding the whole. What's the largest possible horizon so I can take in everything? And so themes of the great, of the great story also include, I'm going to put these together because we sometimes associate these, these with the Holy Family, with, with the qualities of, Mary, of, of Joseph, Mary, and, and Jesus. And so there's this cordial charity that runs through our mission. You know this. And as we understand cordial charity, it means sincere, from the heart. It's real. If people who are recipients of, your, of the mission, where at whatever ministry you're connected with, doesn't, don't feel as if this is for real, we miss the boat. If you write great promotional literature, and people are saying, I just don't feel it, I'm not feeling the love when I go there, we missed it. You've hired a great PR person, but you missed the mission education. What you know when you talk to the recipients of your ministry is that they feel as if they belong there. They're welcome. They're respected. You know you got it. You got it. You have this. This is the quality that you've captured. The discerning heart. I have to be open to others. I, I, I realize, you realize, that we don't possess, possess enough wisdom by ourselves. That's the wisdom. I don't have it all. I'm frankly not smart enough. I'm pretty smart. I'm pretty wise. But I'm not smart enough and wise enough, and so I need the other seven people I was sitting with at the table. To solve a problem, I can't just go in my closet and think about it. I have to talk to others. And I have to figure out who all do I talk to? Who do I say, I don't know enough? Help me. That's what a discerning heart does. And then it says, is this for, for us to do? Is this ours to do? Because everything important to do isn't ours to do. Your ministry can't do everything. At some point you have to say, I am really sorry, but we can't do it all. We will support partners who do the rest. We can't do it. That takes discernment. What do I stretch on, and what do I say, I can't do it all? That I can't do it all is part of the self-emptying. I have to let go of ego. I am not the savior. We really only have one, and it doesn't have the name of Pat. That wasn't his name. But I am a partner, and so, what I have to let go of my ego is in terms of what I can do and what I can't do. I have to say, what battle should I fight and what, which ones should I let go of? It's like everyone tells a story about themselves inside their own head. Are the stories we tell true and relevant? Are they true for this moment in time? Are they transforming? Are they still working for us today? Or do we need to let them go? Do we need to tweak them? Are they shifting? You know, are the issues of today impacting the stories we tell? I'm on the board of our high school, and 10 years ago, we would not have had to have had a conversation about transgender. That was not a question before us 10 years ago. It's a question we have to have today. What are the questions you have to have today? Because otherwise, you're not looking at the more. You're, the field you're looking at isn't broad enough. 
So there are some stories I need to let go of. There are some stories I need to tweak. I want to invite this, this last, um, another angle in our offering about the power of the story. And it's, it's this perspective of integral ecology. I've got to say right away, integral ecology has nothing to do with the environment. Okay? So we are not talking about the environment. We, as much as I care about trees, we are not talking about saving trees here. We are talking about having the widest possible holding of the whole. Integral ecology has to do with our willingness to admit that everything is connected. Absolutely, positively, everything is connected. And so it comes out of the ecology about the home, about the field, about the entire horizon of our reality, and the fact that everything's connected. The human body is a great image for this, and that every system is constantly in communication with every other. If you've got a headache now, you weren't hungry either. And if you have a headache now, even the wine didn't look attractive, maybe. If you have a headache, you really wish I would stop because every system, every part of the body is impacted. If you came, even though you have somebody very close to you who's dying, you're only half here. The other half is somewhere else because every part of us is connected. The circulatory system is connected to the digestive system, is connected to the skeleton, is connected to the muscular, is connected to everything. That's integral. That's what we mean there. And so when we're talking about integral, the spider web is a really good image. And a spider web after it rained, when it, when it, when it almost glows like diamonds, reminds us of, of how beautiful the integral concept is in that everything is connected. We can't just look at our own little place in the universe. That's too small. You might run the best, the best literacy program, the best school, the best program, the best anything. And if you're not aware of the environment in which it's in, we miss it. We miss it. To be faithful to this integral ecology, you in mission, mission work, it's not easy because your critical questions will vary with each ministry. Where's the pushback? It will be different for each of you. But what will you do when push comes to shove? If you can't go back to the Gospels, and you can't go back to the CSJ mission, you have no place to go except to be pushed back indiscriminately. We have to know where to put our feet down. And I want to say the Gospels and CSJ values are the two places. Maybe that's why we have two feet. And so the spider web then is that image. But imagine for a minute, not a spider web, but the Puy lace. Maybe they knew something on a totally unconscious level in the Puy when, when they created some of the most beautiful of lace. That even today, the Puy lace are national treasures. And so when the government of France wants to give a gift, sometimes they give Puy lace. That's how significant it is. And so the strand by strand, in lace. Every strand is connected to every other strand. If you follow it, you can get anywhere on the whole. You can eventually touch anywhere on the lace. That's integral. So that, that all of you are in one room tonight, there is something incredibly symbolic about that. Because what each of you stand for touches everything else. That's key. That's a, that's a piece of art. That's a powerful story you tell. You can pull on any part of this and impact the whole. So as you think about the health and life of your ministry or your ministries, you ask yourself, and what does integral ecology have to offer to this metaphor story? So there might be some questions that you, you file for yourself. What questions, what conversations might this perspective offer to you in your ministry? With whom might you explore these questions? Why is it important to do so now? You have to ask yourself why. It's a little bit of the so what. If you can't answer why, then it's probably not worth it 
You can't, you will not be able to explain yourself out of the rabbit warren you get yourself into. You have to be able to say why. What's the value? What's the, what's the point of identity? Mission is about identity. This is who we are. It's a great line from Martin Luther. I can stand no other place. I have to stand here. It's who I am. I'm CSJ. I have to stand here. And so you ask yourself those questions. Is the story you are telling yourself or telling anyone still working for you? Is it still true? Is it life-giving? Is it relevant today? Does it breathe the qualities of CSJ mission? That, that's underneath this. And so we go back to this slide that we saw before, power of story. We're in a constantly changing world. We're confronted by it all the time. At this given moment, you have the power, and I would say the responsibility, to say, how do you want the story to move forward? Not only this is not how the story needs to end, how do you want it to move forward? You and your ministry have been telling a wonderful, evolving story for a long time. And it's a gift and a grace to be celebrated. And you continue to tell the story today. And so it's important then to ask questions of, of the core values. Yeah. The love of neighbor without distinction, inspired call to the more, the all, um, the all everything kind of love. I realize I, I jumped past that quickly before. You, you know, in, in CSJ jargon, we sometimes talk about all-inclusive, all 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 pervading, all something. We do a lot of these all wraparounds. I want to say it's an all everything kind of love. Sometimes, it's sometimes I would just encourage you, do not let the jargon, anybody's jargon, get in the way of who you are in mission. And so if the jargon doesn't convey it, and I don't mean jargon disrespectfully, if the language doesn't convey it, find a new language. We have a responsibility to be bilingual and trilingual and whatever further out it goes. How many different languages do we need to speak in order to communicate well and to whom? How many different ways of saying this? It's not appropriate to say they should learn the right language. That's arrogant. And so how, how, do we, how else can we say it? Aware of the themes of the deep CSJ story, these things, what title can you give to the next chapter that you and your ministry are writing today? Because you're writing it. Let's imagine that in about two minutes, I'm going to say, have a conversation at your table and play a little bit with, think about your ministry, the one that you're closest connected to, or pick one if you're connected to a number of them. What's the next chapter title? Or what's the last chapter? But imagine what's, what's unfolding, what's needed, what's society ready for, what's the ministry ready for? That's part of the grace. What's the readiness? What title can you give to the next chapter you and your ministry are writing today? But before you do that, I'm going to just share one last piece. And it's a piece of poetry. Everything you do is sacred. It's an invent. And I think it's a, po it's a piece of poetry that says a lot about integral ecology. And I think it says a lot about how it is you do the mission, regardless of what you are doing. Now is the time to know that all you do is sacred. Now is the time to understand that all your ideas of right and wrong were just child training wheels to be laid aside when you finally live with veracity and love. Now is the time for the world to know that every thought and action is sacred. This is the time for you to deeply compute the impossibility that there is anything but grace. Now is the season to know that everything you do is sacred. That's a new county. That's the CHC mission. That's interconnectedness of all things. That's everything is one. Now is the season to know that everything you do is sacred. And so, you are writing a sacred story. You have been telling it for years. Like all good stories, it's not finished. What title can you give to the next chapter that you and your ministry are writing? 